happens every year is that we unfortunately kind of worry right in the middle of something uh, between exam two and, and what we're doing now, which is of course a 3D rigid rotor. And uh, so our R right, so it's a common 3D, 3D rigid rotor. And uh, I don't, uh, I have a little bit on there related to the 3D rigid rotor, but the real thing about it is, the one reason I don't, uh, I'm not too concerned about the way it kind of straddles the two, is that it ends up being a big part of the hydrogen atom. And that was maybe a little, I want to say two thirds of what we did, but maybe not quite that, you know, for this last uh, exam. Obviously a very large amount was the hydrogen atom. Um, regardless, uh, so hopefully you recall that the kinetic energy operator is rather fearsome looking, uh, but really it's just a sine d theta, sine d theta, and that's, I mean, as bad as that is, that's it, right? And, uh, and also, as I mentioned, the exam is way, way, way qualitative, except for the um, I, obviously, I have a derivation section. There's always a derivation section, and those will be, you know, I mean, I, I, I can, I know you all well, well enough through grading as much as I do. That's why I do it. I think you're going to find them kind of hard. It's just a shame because the mathematics on the derivation question, you have identities. The problem is, is that the people who miss them never use the identities because to be blunt you don't know calculus. So um, they're incredibly easy if you know to use the identity. If you don't use the identities, it's completely hopeless. So uh, so you're not going to be seeing a lot of this appearing on the exam. But of course what it does do is I already mentioned that they're big picture, big picture parts. And the big picture is separability and how you can take something that is really hideous, and this, this, this is hideous, I mean, I've seen worse, but, I mean, big is big. Um, you can divvy it up using this little expression for separability into smaller 50 cubes, and of course this one is our 2D rigid rotor. That's why we actually do the 2D rigid rotor. It's, it's like, the, like your homework question, what's unrealistic about the freeway, right? This is a freeway that's just traveling in a circle. It's unrealistic, but it's kind of good warm up for this. And it also ends up being part of the answer. Remember that the 2D rigid rotor is unrealistic because right, it's just something traveling in a, in a circle, but you know, that plane can tilt. And so the 3D rigid rotor allows that, allows it to happen. And if things can rotate in 3D, then they will rotate in 3D. Uh, as usual, with a Hamiltonian in a 18th century math textbook, you get the wave function first, and then the wave functions give the energies, and so I'm, I'm writing this slightly backward. There's our energies. Uh, momentum. Uh, now, we, we talked about how you always solve momentum as L squared, because Hamiltonians are angular momentum squared over 2i. So they always, whenever you see momentum, you really just want to solve L squared. Um, and so what I'm going to do is take that to the half, and that ends up just being square root of L times L plus 1 h bar. Uh, so notice that it's almost square root of L squared, which would be L h bar, which is just like k h bar, which is just like m h bar, just like all the momenta we ever saw. Uh, the 3D rigid rotor is, is like this, uh, so it's almost like that, but that L plus 1 kind of blows it, but anyway, so I'm just trying to point out it doesn't look that different. Um, now the wave functions, which are called, uh, we use, uh, now you notice that I'm starting to use different letters in this part. I started using Y's for the spherical harmonics, which are the wave functions of this thing. And that's just traditional. 
and the spherical harmonics end up being uh, really important to a whole bunch of branches of science. That's why it was solved back in 17 or 18 something something. Uh, God, I already said 17 or 18, I forgot. Hundreds of years ago, because people kept running into it. And so they kept running into it, they're like, well, we might need to solve this. So, uh, uh, and then here's, I wrote it twice, I don't know why. <laughs> okay, some of the things, of course, is note that uh, how um, when, you, when you end up with the separability, one of the Schrodinger equations kind of becomes dominant, and that's because it has the energy in it. And this one doesn't have energy, so I call that kind of like the subordinate. So this is like the primary one, this is like a secondary one. It's just kind of not important, but it's still, it's still part of the answer. Um, we should recognize this as an S state. Uh, these, of course, are P states. And you can see how M influences the result. Um, there's uh, uh, only one, one S state. There's three P states, and so that came up several times. Uh, the S state wave function, I mean, you were just doing this on your homework, right? or last homework. It's just a normalization cost. It's one over the square root of um, four pi. So that, just, let's just call it that. It's a number. Um, here is a P, that's a PZ state. And we know that these, um, these guys are not quite X and Y because you have to make linear combinations with them. Uh, that right now that's not on the exam because it's um, kind of boring. There we go. Finally got it. Okay, so uh, again, remember that I, I, this guy ends up being important because these are end up being these end up being the wave, radial wave function. Sorry, the angular wave functions for the hydrogen atom. So that's why we got to know about these. Um, what's kind of interesting is that. Uh, remember that there's another angular momentum spin, which is like the electron is rotating on its axis, and it can be rotating clockwise or counterclockwise, so it can be spin up or spin down. Now, uh, recall that it's not it's not really rotating. That we know that we don't. No one knows what it's doing, but it behaves just like it's spinning on its axis. Um, so it's just kind of disturbing, and uh, of course there is a spin quantum, a uh, uh, spin operator, which just returns values. It's, I, so you can see why it's identical. It's, uh, so this is the angular momentum of spin. It's identical to L, the angular momentum that we understand, right? So that, that's what it really is rotating about, about its planet, right, the nucleus. And spin, behaves just like that even though we don't think it's rotating. Uh, recall that, and I, and I didn't put this on the test, but the reason that uh, obviously spin wave functions end up being very important, but uh, there's this other thing that I didn't put on the test to accept them yet, which is that um, total angular momentum, if you are in physics class, it's not really that bad. It's just the vector sum, because remember angular momentum is like a vector that represents like the axle of the wheel. Of course the wheel, the hub, is what's rotating. Um, if you have a gyroscope on a tire, <laughs> something like that, um, then the total angular momentum is just the vector sum. But recall that, again, no one cares about angular momentum is angular momentum squared is the only thing that matters because that's related to energy and wave functions of the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonians give energy, are what's real. That's how we think, that's how we interpret it. So anyway, I didn't actually put this on the test, I just, it is kind of important and um, so you have some access if, if for some reason you, you're interested. I spoke a little bit about it in our class, there's more in the textbook. Um, okay, so I mentioned that the important part of all this is that it ends up getting funneled into the hydrogen atom. Awesome. And uh, so the hydrogen atom, I'm not going to write that thing out. I mean, screw that. Uh, you end up with, um, it's basically the same as this. So I'm just writing same. And there's also a radial 
And then there's that uh, unfortunate Coulomb part that does some funny things. It causes all the energies to be negative. Remember, that's its potential surface. And I always drew wave functions, and I always drew the energies uh, over my little picture of a potential surface. So when it comes to the hydrogen atom, uh, it ends up being kind of funky. Um, that ends up being negative. But it, the only relative changes in energy matter. And um, let's see. Um, when we uh, manipulated a little bit more, we were able to uh, we were able to do that separation deal, um, uh, just like we did here, except that there was this part, this part, and the radial part. So, um, so there you go. So I should do that, and of course that means that the wave functions are. Uh, and I stopped using the letter psi here. We've got an N and an L. We have a radial wave function, and again the spherical harmonics, just like we talked about just a few seconds ago. And um, let's see, what do I want to say else? Uh, um, the wave functions, the radial, ended up being really pretty important because when we did this, when we did the separability trick, the energy ended up getting sucked into the radial part. Just like the energy was sucked into the theta part, that ended up being kind of the dominant, the one we can't kind of care about a bit more, the one that's unfortunately a little harder to solve. That also happened with the hydrogen atom. The radial got the energy, so the radial mini Schrodinger equation ends up being like really important, and it defines the energy. The radial wave functions, uh, we did, some messing around with the radial part. We simplified it at long and short distances and fine. Um, sometimes I put that on the test right now. This year I didn't. Uh, regardless, of course, everything is always normalized. Recall that the short distance behavior, if, if again, we took the radial Schrodinger equation, which was 10 miles long, and we took out all the terms that were small if R is big. We then showed that R to the L is a solution. Uh, and again, that was for the limit of, of small R and that uh, large R, um, okay, we're gonna have some kind of connector. At large R, we found that E to the minus R over N A naught. Uh, exponential decay, and exponential decay is what the wave function wants to do at large r. And again, we took the radial Hamiltonian, made r very big, got rid of the terms that were not important, and found that e to the minus something times r was um, um, a solution. So uh, this behavior ends up being very important in terms of how the wave functions look, which did make it to the exam. And let's see, um, connectors do things like they, just like the vibrational, this is really similar to the same thing, the same concept we ran into vibrational wave functions. That there's a, th those have Hermite polynomials and these have Laguerre polynomials. That's not, you don't have to remember that. The connector's job ends up basically just putting in nodes as you go to higher energy states. So uh, this guy takes care of how things rotate. Uh, because of the R to the L, L is zero for S states and the non-zero for everything else. So I expect big differences between S states and P states. You gotta put in nodes to make higher energy states because they need more energy and nodes would do that. And then we have to decay off at some point because the hydrogen atom is not infinitely big. And you may notice I put in an N. N is of course the, uh, that's the radial, a couple of principal quantum number uh, but it's really, I always call it the radial quantum number. Um, because you know that every time you solve one of these tippy keys, you get an infinite number of solutions, and the mathematicians happen to, happen to always use a way of tracking that, which we call a quantum number. It ends up telling us, you know, to them it's just whatever. For us, it's ground state, the lowest quantum number is always the ground state, and the higher quantum numbers are excited state, so they mean something to us. But again, this is 
math of things that are real. Okay, so the radial wave functions end up looking like, um, let's say L equals zero, I won't say which ends. Uh, the radial wave functions for 1s is just an exponential decay. Oh, the axis is not good. There we go. So that's just an exponential decay. Uh, so that's a 1s, and I know that's a 1s because there's no nodes. A 2s uh, has a node, and again, that's so that it has higher kinetic energy. Remember that nodes always increase your kinetic energy because it technically makes the wave function curvier. Uh, there's also that concept that the wave functions, orthonormality, the wave functions integrated times each other have to integrate to zero uh, unless it's the wave fun the same wave function square, in which case it integrates to one. That's normalization, which you've seen for a very long time. Um, okay, so the S states are different uh, because of that you know, R to the L, which is one for L equals zero. And you can see that the wave function is non-zero. It math speak, it's finite, so that's proper math speak. Uh, for <laughs> not being zero is called finite. And remember that that would imply that the electron can touch the nucleus. But uh, and that would be bad because the Coulombic energy would release infinite amounts of energy and everything gets destroyed. Which after my last night, it'd be okay, but it doesn't happen because the electron actually never finds it, right? So that's why we have those radial distribution functions, which are in your textbook, and I talked about them last time. Um, so again, it's kind of a simple thing. We model the nucleus as a point. Points have no volume. How can you ever hit something with no volume? It is a kind of, that's kind of a logical, logical argument. Uh, okay, and of course, then the uh, Non-S states, oh, one of my tricks is, I, again, I do have one or two more questions to write. One of my tricks is, in like what's wrong, see I, what I like about what's wrong is I can come up with anything. So there's always, it, there's always new questions. It's good to have new questions. Um, I can, I, I, one of the things I like to do is I talked about the 1P state. Right, there is no 1P state. <laughs> anyway, that's one of my little tricks, okay. So a 2s has no nodes. Okay, go a longer. A 2s. Now the fact that it's at zero zero that does not count as a node. Just in again, it just doesn't. So you know, go, go scream at the math department. That's their thing. Okay, and here we do see. Do I call that 2s? It's 2p. What the hell's wrong? 3p. 3p has a node. So again, this is actually kind of routine. And um, then let's also do a 3D. I'll draw that separately. Uh, so R, uh, L is 1, so L equals 2. So this is a 3D state. And the thing that, in terms of asking problems, uh, you know, sometimes I will say, well, which one's an S, which one's a P? If you have my old exams, you saw a couple of those. Uh, but I ha always have trouble with P versus D because P versus D really looks similar. So this would be a 3D. It's the first D state that exists. So there's no nodes. Uh, the only way you can tell uh, the difference between a D and a P is that uh, there's different behavior, right? So this is kind of like a line, like X equals Y, except the Y is uh, Y is the wave function and X is R. R to the 1 is R. And here we've got Y versus X squared. So notice that I drew that where X is R. And notice I drew that like a little parabola. So that's how they're different. Now recall that um, these guys have to be zero. It, now remember it's okay here because the wave function, the, the, the electron doesn't ever touch the nucleus. And here they definitely don't touch the nucleus. So cool, but it's necessitated for a different reason, which is that as they get closer, they start spinning faster. And if they go infinitely close to the nucleus, they would be spinning with infinite amounts of energy, which is, uh, yeah, that would be a bit of a problem. <laughs> so, uh, so those guys have to be zero. Uh, that's why you get that R to the L, R to the L behavior. Um, 
And of course they die off. Uh, the higher the principal quantum number, which is our one, two, P, or, sorry, our one and our two and our three, um, the higher principal quantum number, uh, the wave functions get wider and wider because of that. Uh, and I, uh, with wave functions, of course, now we know the energies. Here's the reduced mass, charge of the electron to the fourth power for I don't know why, that's just what we did. It's um, kind of hideous looking, permeativity of free space. I always, when I see the permeativity of free space, I know I'm in trouble. And principal quantum number, the because the energy goes into the radial, the radial is the most important, so therefore its principal quantum number is the most important because it, it takes energy. Uh, but recall that you can also put this in the familiar h bar squared k squared over 2m. Uh, so h bar squared over 2, I can reduce mass. Now k, uh, so h bar squared k squared over 2m was for free waves. It was really a particle in a box. We saw that behavior really on everything, for a hydrogen atom, it's just going to be 1 over a Bohr squared. So uh, remember that K's momentum, um, K's are, have units of 1 over length, so I guess this kind of makes sense. I guess that's minus, right? Yeah. So anyway, I like, I like looking at that because I can see that my, my momentum squared, my K squared, that we saw so many freaking times, it's really still here. It's just now 1 over a Bohr squared instead of just a K squared. Uh, and notice that this is um, about minus 13.6 electron volts over n squared. And 13.6 electron volts, if you recall our spectroscopy, this and that, is a, a painfully large amount of energy. And all the other little bits were, of course, that uh, we talked a little bit about P and E orbitals. A PZ state is just the L equals 1, M equals 0 state. But our PX and PY are a little different. And that's because our 3D spherical harmonics uh, have, uh, they have traveling waves. They have E to the IM phi. And we don't like that. Uh, we don't like traveling waves because we think of we think of these electrons in a hydrogen atom as sitting still, uh, but a traveling wave would not sit still. So what you do is you make linear combinations of that part that offends you, the e to the i m t plus e to the minus i m t, e to the i m t minus e to the i minus i m t, and if you recall, that ends up wiping out that part and you end up with what you had been taught before was um, uh, uh, X, and, X and Y orbitals and PZ is still PZ. E to the IMZ with M is zero, right? So if one of them is okay by right? itself, so that is a good PZ. Other things we could do with, spec were with the hydrogen, hydrogen atom, uh, with spectroscopy, uh, after we get over from spectroscopy, then we start getting into things that we can't actually deal with, like spin orbit coupling or, or God forbid, multiple electrons. Uh, then we run into problems with actually solving the Schrodinger equation. But this was so this was our last deal that we were able to um, uh, to handle. And of course the uh, that unfortunately also called what is that micro or mu? Same as, same as our reduced mass of the hydrogen atom. Um, so that's the operator, and that is the definition of a dipole from physics two. Uh, but we need, you know, practically, if you don't want to lose your mind, you're going to probably use plane polarized light, and so you just uh, you just call just call it x, y, or z. And remember, I, I, I made a little column to show it's like one or the other. If I, if I wrote it as a line, you might think they were all multiplied. Um, so what was kind of funny about the dipole operator, it does a lot of weird things. It's like, it's like not what I told you to do. So I, that kind of always bothers me about this. And by not what I 
told you to do is you have an expectation value and we always have a complex conjugate on the left. If we're doing electronic spectroscopy, we're looking at the final state, complex conjugate, the operator. Um, and, and again, where it's weird is that the initial state, the initial state and the final state are not the same because it, it always was in every expectation value we ever had except this one. Uh, because it doesn't make sense to have the, <laughs> the, the final state, the initial state means nothing happened. So, uh, and recall that this is related to how, how strong the transition is. And I know it's like, what does it mean for a transition to be strong? It means it has a, Beers, uh, a large Beer's Law coefficient. Now, I hope that you learned about Beer's Law in high school. And God, God knows we should have done it in freshman and analytic. So, of course, that's, you know, Beer's Law is. So this is the Beer's Law coefficient, essentially. And, uh, but I can tell you that because I've actually made some approximations. Remember I said like we're only concerned about the electric field, right? That's, that's the dipole, that's the electric dipole. Uh, but light has a magnetic field. So, so I'm making some approximations here. And as a result, uh, this, this isn't really that great, doesn't work that well. But what it does do really well is either zero or something else. So what we really care about is, is it zero or not? And uh, depending on what makes it zero or not, you can get a selection rule. And for, for a hydrogen atom, for a hydrogen atom, you have L is plus or minus one. And so 1s goes to 2p, 2p goes to 3d or 3s. 3s goes to 4p. Anyway, it's, I think you know what delta L plus or minus 1 is. Minus 1 would probably be more useful for like fluorescence. Uh, excited 2p hydrogen created by some stellar impact or something fluoresces to the ground state that produced UV light. Um, so uh, there's a couple things to unpack here. Um, one is um, one is that okay a hydrogen atom here's here's a simple question that could really throw you off because it's so simple you know the simplest question is really can send you to tailspin uh, and we talked uh, about a week on just spectroscopy in general so what kind of spectroscopy am I talking about when, with with the hydrogen atom what's the selection rule for what. What, what part of the spectrum does it lie in? Well, you would know by the difference between final and initial states that gives you energetically, and, and for hydrogen, that's going to be a, a big number because um, it, it's just, that's what the energies are. And um, bum, bum, bum. Uh, so obviously hydrogen does not have vibrational or rotation spectrum because that's nonsense. It's only got an electron can't rotate, it needs another atom to rotate. H2 could rotate. Uh, oh, and H2 could also vibrate. So, uh, when it comes to spectroscopy in general, um, what you can often do, so like for the hydrogen atom, we just had the electronic, and that was that monster that I've been talking about for so long. But if it is H, you know, for a hydrogen atom, if it's H2, there's a vibrational Hamiltonian, which we've done, there's a rotational Hamiltonian, which actually is the 3D rigid rotor. And so the wave function, the total wave function, is going to end up being an electronic. Uh, a, we're going to talk a lot more about the electronic. The vibrational one, which we've done. And the rotational, uh, I should call that, I should call that a Y, shouldn't I, right? So, because uh, that one's special. Um, so, uh, and so that's why you see things like an absorption. Uh, let's look at a visible. Invisibles are always in the nanometer. And we'll look at uh, my favorite pyrene. So this is a visible. Uh, a visible. And this would be in the near UV. Uh, and, and really what you're seeing is. Um, the visible is really the electronic times the vibrational. So the electronic being the dominant one here, 
has higher energy. And that's why this is uh, for like those aromatics like pyrene, benzene. You, you've had actually several questions looking at the absorption of pyrene, benzene in previous questions and then we brought it up again here. Um, you get those projections which are the vibrational component and this kind of comes at, about because your wave functions having a Hamiltonian that can be divvied up into parts, your wave functions multiply and of course the dipole operator ends up being uh, a function of where the electrons are at and where the atoms are at. And because of that, you ended up with um, an expression for the transition dipole that ended up looking like uh, the electronic final. So just what I wrote a minute ago uh, with asking where all the electrons are at. So there's I electrons. Uh, so this is the game we were just playing before. And it ends up being multiplied by the vibrational wave functions, but there's no operator in between. And um, so that ends up looking like this. So we've got a ground state, and it has a regular vibrational wave function. Then you've got an excited state, and it has its own vibrational ground state, and it has an excited state. I didn't draw that very well. Um, and then if you project this up here, you can see that there's not a lot of overlap uh, from ground vibration to ground vibrational state, but it looks actually kind of good for the first excited state. So what you see here is here's a transition between the ground vibrational state to the ground vibrational state in the excited electronic state, and there's not much intensity or really no intensity, and that's because of what I just drew here. And then this is the next transition which I drew here. So this is called the Frank Condon effect and considered really one of the most important things in spectroscopy. Uh, notice I've been writing a lot of integrals. Uh, integral, integral, integral. And this did make it to your homework. Uh, homework, sorry, you definitely made it to your homework if you did it. Made it to the test. Uh, having some math skills. Uh, I mean, if you got to a career that actually used mathematics, you're the person who got wealthy because those jobs pay a lot. So, uh, of course, you better be able to do it. If you tell those people that you can do it, uh, remember that, uh, you know, we started out with everything. Obviously, we started simple. Three waves. Cosine x, dx, right? Everything was easy. As we built up and built up and of course got into higher dimensions, which is where we're at now, uh, you recall that this R squared sine theta comes about from Jacobians. And that's because integrating with respect to radius, theta, and phi do not actually represent volume. Uh, and integrals should represent, three-dimensional integrals should represent volume. Dx, dy, and dz, that's obviously volume. X times y times z is, is the definition of volume that you learn about in grade school. R, theta, and phi are not volume, so you have to have this correction factor. And now you may also, one thing I tried to emphasize was, why is this not just 4 pi r squared? Uh, that's when you're just ignoring the radial part. But in this class, you, you really shouldn't. Okay. So this is the stuff we could do with the hydrogen atom, but then we started running into phenomenon that meant that our ability, you know, our ability to do this, remember this is called analytical, when I, when I write down functions as e to the theta and all that jazz, those are analytical solutions, but we start running into issues that even our 18th century or 20th century mathematicians look at it and say, well, good luck with that, because I'm out. Go talk to, you know, Tobor, the supercomputer. Uh, only the supercomputers can answer some problems because uh, of things like spin orbit. So when I wrote down the Hamiltonian for the hydrogen atom, I left out the spin orbit effect, which is a constant, I think it's in the textbook, some constant in L dot S. 
And what that is, is that an electron spinning on its axis, and it can, then, it can spin up or spin down, so I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing the arrow with spin up, but it could, it could spin the other way. Uh, it's got a magnetic field, uh, but it's also, if it's in a P state, it, it's rotating, so there's the nucleus. So it's rotating, um, and so I've drawn that also. So I, I, I made both of these spin up, but again, they could be rotating the other way. Uh, rotating charges, whether spinning on this axis like a basketball by Michael Jordan, or rotating around like a spinning cat on its tail, uh, in either case, spinning charges create magnetic fields. And this damn thing is creating two simultaneously, you know, thank you, and it's acting on itself. So it creates its own magnetic field twice, and they may be aligned, which remember, oh, that's good, no, it's bad. North, north, no good, south, south, no good. What you want them is anti-aligned, uh, anti-parallel, north, south, south, north, that's good. So big picture is spin over the coupling, and you can see why there's an L dot S. Um, because there's an L magnetic field and an S magnetic field from the same particle. That's the part that's just really strange, is that one object creates two magnetic fields. That's where it just gets really strange. But that's what it does. And what it does is uh, it takes our degenerate uh, two P states of PX, PY, and PZ. And what that does is it lifts the degeneracy. Uh, two states are higher in energy than the lower one. And the way to understand this is to understand how you add angular momentum, which I mentioned earlier. But again, that's something that I usually cover in grad school, how to, how to do this. It's in your textbook, though, if you're interested. Um, now, remember the reason that this is part of the hydrogen atom. And we can see spectroscopic signatures of the, excuse me, of the spin orbit coupling in hydrogen from hydrogen. Or it's in an example I found, I put in chapter 15. Um, I thought it was a cool example, it made a cool picture that people look at hydrogen fluorescence from the galaxy to make pictures of the galaxy. I just thought that was a cool picture, so that's why I included it. Um, so it's a real effect, but I never put that in the Hamiltonian itself. I am figuring this out with hydrogen wave functions that were solved without this, but I shouldn't have done that, right? You see what I mean? I'm supposed to solve the Hamiltonian in everything in the Hamiltonian, but I left this damn thing out. I got wave functions, cool, but, but why? Well, the answer is, is that with this in there, I can't solve the Hamiltonian anymore. So I just left it out and prayed that everything worked out anyway, which it largely does. And that's because this energetic splitting is really, really tiny. Um, you had other examples. Um, such as start, spec, start, same on, and then I even call like forming bonds, called forming bonds, kind of like perturbation theory. It's not really considered. Uh, so, so perturbation theory is when I just use hydrogen wave functions without spin orbit, without a Zeeman magnetic field without a stark electric field. I just leave those things out even if they're present to solve it, which, you know, this is the answer right here. And then I try to figure out what happens after the fact using, uh, and again, that's not the right approach, but it's the only approach that I can do on pen and paper. And let's see, now the other thing, now that I'm talking about spin, now we need to do spin wave functions and another thing that is uh, very important uh, about um, you know when when can we not really deal with the hydrogen uh, with the Schrodinger equation anymore? It's because we have things in the Hamiltonian that mean that we can't solve it, and so when we have multi electron atoms, so helium. So when we get to helium, we can no longer solve the Schrodinger equation. We can't technically do it for for hydrogen because of the spin orbit technically. Um, okay, but I, I, either way, um, uh, when we have multiple electrons, remember we have to do this deal. Uh, we have to have a minus sign. Oh, that's usually done one, two, two, one. Not that it doesn't matter. Um, but recall that there's that property of anti-symmetry to interchange. That's what this is anti-symmetry to interchange. You have to do that because, uh, and again, look at the notes. 
if you were to tempted to write a hydrogen anion or a helium atom like this with a two spin up and a one s state, I mean that's kind of the ground state except it's really spin up and spin down. Uh, uh, so if you did this, you you you've got to get a zero wave function, which is just nature's way of saying no, you're not allowed to do that. So, because of that, we have to insert this property. And again, I know that it's like, well, why does this do that? I showed that in class, and you'll have to look at it. Um, and um, so, so that's all fine and good. Now, we have to look at two limiting forms. Um, we know that because now, now that we have spin, we, it gives us, unfortunately, too much flexibility. Here, let's do, a one, uh, let's do an excited hydrogen anion where there's an electron in a 1s and, and another one in the 2s. The um, one way to write that wave function is, um, at first, I've got the first electron in its orbital and the second electron in its orbital, which makes sense. But then I permute that, which seems weird. But I'm doing that because I can't technically say that which, you know, I can't label the electron as being the first one or the second one. So that's why that's done. Uh, and then this part, this anti-symmetry, ends up being a really simple thing to do using spin wave functions. It's the same deal except you have a minus sign. And again, if you permute all the ones and twos, that means make all the ones and twos and all the twos and one, uh, you pick up a minus sign. And again, that means that you can't do this, which is good because you shouldn't, and everything is great. Uh, now again, because of our new thing of spin that we're, um, we're now correctly taking into account because it does exist, I've got two ways of creating a 1s, 2s hydrogen anion up, down, and up, up, and so that we know is a triplet. And the triplet is going to have, uh, the, the minus sign is going to be in what is the space part. And um, so that takes care of that very odd looking statement of uh, anti-symmetry to interchange. And I have to do that because there's no way to insert that behavior in the spin wave functions um, because there's only, because you just can't. It's just impossible. Um, and as I mentioned several times, here's the weird one. Up, up, down, down is perfectly sensible, but you also get this one that is, um, it looks like two singlets, but it's, it's not. So, so there you go. <laughs> Now, the multi-electron Hamiltonian has uh, a bunch of stuff in it. It has a bunch of stuff in it. And it also has this very unfortunate, uh, this electrons interacting bit by Coulomb's law, sorry, in the way. Um, so, so this is a plus, right? So that's energy raising. And what you find is that if you calculate the energy of that triplet, and this is done in your textbook, I, I, it took me hours to do that, by the way. If you calculate the energy of the triplet versus the singlet state, you find that the triplet's actually lower in energy, and it's due to this thing right here. Uh, now, the textbook, there's an appendix where I actually worked through all this to show that this is the case. Really, it just comes down to is that this is simply fundamentally not the same as that. And so you're not going to get the same expectation value. And it just turns out that the triplet is lower in energy than the singlet. And there you go. Other things that we covered uh, included, so we're talking about multi electron atoms, shielding and shielding ended up um, doing something pretty funny. It ended up being important because it ended up giving the, uh, uh, the uh, periodic table its, its shape uh, because of shielding. 
Okay, so this is what we expect. This is true for a hydrogen atom with one electron, but as soon as you add an electron, the shielding effect kicks in. And again, that was actually on your homework. And that is why you end up with um, you end up with P's being higher in energy orbitals than S's. So it shouldn't do that. Um, then you end up switching even princi switch switching principal quantum numbers. So hopefully I did this right. I hope I did that right. So that's why the periodic table has an S block. Technically the F block is always uh, written below it, even though it's actually in between the S and the D block. And then the P block comes next. Notice that this is just kind of weird because you would expect to go like S, P, D, F, but instead we're going S, F, D, P, right? So we're kind of writing this in a weird order, but that's because of what I just drew there. So that's why it just works the way it does. Um, last bit is I did do uh, some amount of time, I did do matrices. So recall that because our ability to analytically solve anything is shot. Once we do multi-electrons, we then do this perturbation theory uh, with matrices where we do things like uh, determine bonds using, um, uh, uh, so we have one, one, we have on the diagonal, uh, these are wave functions that are interacting through either a bond, through a bond that wants to form, or through a magnet, through an electric field. That was the Stark effect. You may recall, if you look at your homework on the Stark effect, you may notice that what I was actually doing was I was actually giving you one of these off-diagonal elements. And now you know enough to know that these off-diagonal elements are what causes things to mix and split. So with this, uh, you then figure out how the determinant minus the eigenvalues equals zero. You had a homework on that. And then you get, you get new wave functions. And for hydrogen, that like, uh, that, that's what you just did. You, um, you can see that the wave functions add for two hydrogen atoms, which means that they build electron density between them, or they subtract, which means that they don't build up electron density. For a Stark effect, again, which was a 2s and a 2p, those were my two wave functions, you found that there's, um, you saw the diagonal, I didn't make that clear at the time. Um, you find that there are two solutions with two different energies. When you have an electric field, so you would do something like this. You would get an excited state that would be this one. You get a ground state that would be this one. You get their energies, and you get the wave functions are just mixtures of S and P states. And again, very similar to what you did on your homework with hydrogen SS and the oxygen mixing. So again, this guy actually didn't make it to the test, uh, as well as kinetics. And what I did there was. Um, just note that when, just make sure you can write kinetic rate laws, which is that the change in A with time is equal to minus K1A. Remember that. Remember that the difficulty comes in from the fact that everything's changing with time. That's why that is difficult. That's, I talked about that last lecture. Anyway, I'm not too long.